All right, uh, let's go through these slides and start kind of talking about the telephony standards and protocols. Um, we're going to talk about several things within this, this uh, slide deck here. First of which is going to be voice and video codecs. Of course, the new addition from the CCI voice to the CCI collaboration is video codec. Um, there's also a couple of little additions that uh, weren't really mentioned a whole lot in the, in the CCI voice that we'll talk about today. Also, we're going to talk about media protocols, namely RTP, because that's what's going to be transporting your media, whether it be voice or video. We're also going to be talking about uh, you know, signaling protocols, which is going to be Skinny, uh, which is SCCP. We're going to be talking about Media Gateway Control Protocol, which is MGCP, and Session Initiation Protocol, which is SIP. And also, yes, Lou, I am reversed. Uh, so just so I can kind of, it's almost like for me, it's like looking in a mirror, essentially, so I can point that way, point that way, and it makes sense. Just a little aside into the behind the scenes <laughs> of the video production. So um, Skinny, MGCP, and SIP are the, are the signaling protocols we'll talk about today. We also have the H323 gateways and gatekeeper. Yes, gatekeeper is on the written exam, even though it's not on the lab exam. So we still need to be familiar with how that works and what's involved in the gatekeeper configuration. Uh, we're going to talk about analog telephony, digital telephony, and the different types of signaling you can use with each of those technologies. And then finally, we'll follow that up with fax and modem protocols. And I'm sorry, that just kind of worked out that way with <laughs> those kind of those topics being towards the end of the lecture and the end of the day. Uh, I know that's uh, it might be a tough topic to do um, to keep interest in, but uh, unless unless you're from the old school voice world, in which case you're going to love that part of the lecture. So let's uh, move on to voice and video codecs. As long as there are no questions. All right. Voice and video codecs. What the heck is a codec anyway? Um, it's actually a coder or coder decoder, and they've just combined the two words to make codec. Brilliant, right? Um, and it performs encoding and decoding on a digital data stream. That's the whole point. So one side encodes it, the other side decodes it. And if they're both running that same codec, then they can easily encode and decode and pass the information back and forth. These DSPs are digital signal processors that are on these specific voice routers that, are, that the tra traffic is passing through, but they're going to be processing these voice signals from analog to digital, and then from digital to analog, and also from digital to digital in some cases. So you'll need DSP resources to pull that off. Um, so the commonly used codecs that you're going to see you know, in the CCI collaboration written and also the CCI collaboration lab, first one, the new one is H.264. That is a video codec, and it's used for recording, compression, and distribution of video content, technically, right? <laughs> um, and the, the goal is to provide quality streaming at, at uh, lower speeds. So if you have a you know, H.264 enabled video phone like a 9971, you can make a video call across a network somewhere that supports H.264 um, to make a video call between those two endpoints. The next codec is Internet Low Bitrate Codec, which is ILBC. This is one of those that wasn't really focused on a whole lot for the CCI voice, but now it's coming into light a lot for the collaboration. It's a high complexity speech codec supported by SIP, Skinny, H323, MGCP, and is at 15.2 kilobits per second with 20 millisecond frames sampling rate and or sampling time and then 13.33 kilobits per second at 30 millisecond frame size. So just very various bandwidths right there. It's good to know, you know, the type of bandwidth that these bandwidths that these codecs can operate at. So good information to have. Um, Internet speech audio codec, which is ISAC, bandwidth adaptive codec using streaming applications with bit, rate, bit rates from 10 to 32K and a sampling frequency of 16 kilohertz. So we're going to talk about I'm actually going to draw a little bit of what this means, the sampling rate and frequency, so we can kind of understand what this is talking about. You know, so it makes it a little bit more than just numbers. I mean, we have obviously the 15.2K and 13.33K are numbers that we can understand pretty easily because we've always worked with you know, kilobits per second, megabits per second, that type of thing. But uh, you know, the sampling frequency and sampling rate, bit depth, 
that type of thing, which is also audio engineering type stuff, um, is good to understand, to understand how a codec actually works. But we'll talk about some more codecs before we do that. The, so the commonly used codecs that are continued from the previous slide, uh, low overhead audio transport multiplex, LATM. It's supposed to provide superior sound quality for voice and music for SIP and Tanberg endpoints. You can see the variable bit rate here at 48, 56, 64, or 128. Uh, for those of you who, you know, are in the music downloading revolution, of course, everybody is now. The, you know, most commonly used format for MP3s is 128K. It's not necessarily the best quality for, for audio, um, you know, that you can get in an MP3. I prefer like 320. I think that's the best way to go. But anyway, um, 128 is really amazing for a voice codec. I mean, we're talking about very clear speech at that point uh, if, you, if you're allowing the bit rate to go that high. Uh, next thing, G7.722, uh, G.722. It's got a sampling rate of 16 kilohertz and a frequency range of 7 kilohertz. Now, if you remember from... Uh, digital networking 101 basically uh, digital telephony 101 you have the sampling range uh, for your phone is only all it's it's like three and a half kilohertz basically you're going from from only a small little little frequency band basically and so now this this G722 is going to give you almost double that or actually just about double that frequency range so the theory there is it's going to give you better audio quality and if you can make a call with G722 and G711, um, you may not be able to, to tell the difference, you know, if you're just testing it by yourself, but if, if you have that run in your network somewhere and you look, you look on your phone, hit the double question mark, and you see that you run a G722, just take note, I mean, you'll, you'll see a lot more frequencies represented, namely like the low end. You'll notice a lot more bass in someone's voice if you're using G722 because it's a higher quality frequencies, uh, frequency range that's, that it's uh, analyzing there. So, uh, wideband codecs, G.722.1, G and then on the next page there's .2. Uh, but this is uh, another high quality speech codec with a bit rate of 24 or 32K per second. Another 7 kilohertz uh, with uh, 16 kilosamples per second, KSPS, audio coding. And supported for SIP and H323 only. So you only see those with those two types of endpoints. G722, forgot to mention, is supported both with Skinny and SIP and a variable bit rate of 48, 56, and 64. Let me go to the next slide here and then I'll, I'll start explaining kind of what that, what these bit rate things mean. Um, G.722.2, just the second version of that codec, and it's an adaptive multi-rate wideband codec. So it means it can shift, basically. It's, it, it adapts, adapts to the uh, situation that it's forced in. A bit rate of 16K per second and a frequency range of 16 kilohertz. So let me go back here um, just to get some of these frequency ranges to the first one. So the sampling frequency of, of 16 kilohertz. Let's take a look at that. Get rid of my wireless diagram. So let's say that you have um, basically an, an analog signal that's coming. And we're, that's what we're talking about. We're turning an analog signal into a digital signal. That's the whole point of a codec. So an analog waveform is you know, what's generated from you, you speaking. So that looks, in a close-up view, something like that. You know, and as you zoom out, it's just a bunch of garbage that you can't really tell. But it, when you zoom in to this waveform, it's basically just an endless uh, loop of up and down, basically. So in this, in this loop, this represents your, your voice, your speech. And the goal of a codec is to try to turn that speech into digital information. So if you're taking a frequency range or frequency rate of 16 kilohertz, that means it's taking a sample of your voice 16,000 times a second. So generally speaking, that can get pretty stinking accurate. So what that means, yeah, sine wave, Mike, thank you. <laughs> um, sine wave. Uh, but the sampling rate at 16K would mean, let's say, 
we're taking a sample of this little section, this little section, that little section, and so forth. And so it's just taking a bunch of little chops of each of these sections of the sine wave. Um, and then that information then is represented in digital form, let's say with, if it's 4-bit, it could be represented that way. So if it's 16-bit or 24-bit or whatever, you know, then that, that quality will go up because then you have more ways to represent that specific waveform. So if it's 16-bit, then you have 16 bits with which to represent this specific part that we're looking at. So the, the only thing is, and, and this is another one of those things, like I said, that overlaps with my hobby, audio engineering, you can, you can take as many samples of a wave that you want, a sine wave that you want, but you'll never, ever get it to be where it's exactly like an analog wave. And, and they, they've got codecs now, you know, like the codecs we've, we've mentioned here that are just ridiculously good and, and you can't really even tell, you know, like if the quality's bad or not. I mean, they were all very good quality. So, but what I'm saying is, you know, you're expecting a certain quality on the phone, but, you know, it's never going to match that of your analog voice like being in the same room with someone because when you think about it, you're taking this sample but it doesn't go up like that on an angle. You know, it, it's either a one or a zero, so it's gotta be squared off. So when you take a sample, it really gets right here. I'm exaggerating a little bit so you can see the difference. And this spot right here, this little triangle, is not able to be represented by that sample, essentially. And obviously this is super magnified. We're talking about very small pieces of the sine wave but that means that you'll never truly be able to, to represent that analog signal digitally. So, and, you know, just one of those things that you, you can take away from calculus, I guess, um, the integration stuff and finding the area under, under a curve. Never thought I would use that stuff, but I guess I, I did. Um, but, yeah, so moral of the story, this, you'll never be able to represent an analog wave perfectly with a digital signaling technology. You just can't do it. Um, you can make it better, but it'll never be perfect. Um, so anyway, I hope that that makes sense there um, with the frequency rate and the, you know, this, this right here, by the way, also is called the bit depth. Um, if you represented that by four zeros, you know, so, so it's a four bit depth on that. So any questions on that so far? All right, moving on to media protocols. So really the only media protocol we're gonna talk about is, is real-time transport protocol, RTP. RTP is, is the protocol that's used between phones, obviously, to, to exchange voice information. You know, it provides end-to-end -end network functions for delivery of delay-sensitive real-time traffic. So as you know, voice is very delay sensitive. If you have any problems in your network, you'll figure it out really quickly if you're, if you're trying to run voice over it uh, because it just it will sound choppy and the quality will be bad. And it runs on top of UDP, as you would imagine it would, because if it ran on TCP, then you would have to constantly be acknowledging receipt of frames instead of where UDP where it just sends it out and it doesn't acknowledge it, so which is called connectionless. So the payload type identification, sequence numbering, and time stamping is also provided by RTP. And of course, you want to you want to identify what kind of traffic you're carrying in RT in in the protocol on RTP, so that the other side can interpret it. You also want to have a sequence number. That's super important because it, I mean, if you don't have sequence numbers, the speech could be very garbled. I mean, you'll you'll receive you always re you not always, but a lot of the time you'll receive packets that are completely out of order at at the receiving end, you know, just based on how it was routed through the network. And the receiver is intelligent enough to resort those packets based on the sequence number. So the sequence number is absolutely essential um, to, to RTP. And then timestamping is also uh, useful for, for the information to kind of, you know, obviously troubleshooting is a great, great need for timestamping there. And RTP uses even port numbers, just a good little uh, trick to know there. Any questions so far? <clears throat> okay. 
Uh, Real-time transport control protocol, RTCP, works in conjunction with RTP. It provides out-of-band control information regarding RTP flows. So that means it's going to provide information about the quality of the voice stream, QoS, delay, jitter, and it's going to use the next higher port number. So if I use 16384 for my UDP port number for my RTP stream, then this next port number would be 16385 for RTCP. So that's just used to provide that control information to get information about the actual stream itself. Secure real-time transfer protocol is just the secure version of the protocol. That's, that's basically all it is. It's a way to, to encrypt that traffic so you can't take Wireshark and, and listen on a LAN and, and try to get somebody's conversation for yourself. Um, it uses AES 128-bit encryption and HMAC SHA-1 for the authentication. And uh, the, the next thing here, obviously you have a secure RTP, you also have a secure RTCP. And that's obviously just the secure version of, of uh, RTCP. So any questions on that? Doesn't look like it yet. All right, so now that those two things are out of the way, we got the codecs out of the way, we got the media out of the way. Now let's talk about the actual signaling protocols. How do these media streams get set up and how do the codecs get selected and things like that. So the first thing is Skinny Client Control Protocol, which is SCCP. It is a Cisco proprietary signaling protocol, of course, and it's been around for a long time and obviously is the default protocol on on phones actually and, and now um, that's changed a little bit with these these new phones that have come out the 8971s 9971s and so forth the 89 and 89 and 99 series 9900 series phones use the SIP protocol now exclusively so but the skinny protocol is still all over the UC network so it's definitely still necessary to use it's a master slave model which means that you have one side of it that's basically controlling the session, and you have another side that's just just executing the commands that the master wants it to execute. Um, so in this case, the master is going to be communications manager, and the slave is going to be the phone. So it's a master-slave relationship. It uses TCP ports 2000 through 2003, and there is uh, SCCPS, which is the secure version of Skinny as well. So C CUCM uses Skinny to control phones, first of all. It also uses Skinny to control analog ports on voice gateways. You can use Skinny for the, for the voice gateways there. And also Skinny for media resources, which are vastly important in the system. That's the native way that it's, it's controlled within Communications Manager, whether it be a transcoder, conference bridge, you know, MTP. It's all done through Skinny. The uh, next thing is that, this is, and this is pretty important to note, is that Skinny sends DTMF digits out of band. And what that means is that there's actually a separate little channel to send DTMF digits, like dual tone multi-frequency is what it stands for, and that's simply when you're pressing a number on the keypad that generates a DTMF tone, and then those digits get sent uh, over a control channel rather than the media channel. So if you're sending digits over a media channel, then you need to make sure that those digits can be interpreted, because when you think about what DTMF actually is, it's just a frequency that's being generated by a key, and that's what it was used for in the old old school phone systems, and it was actually interpreted at the other end based on reading that frequency, of course. And now we're just turning that frequency into digital representations of that frequency and sending the digits along in this control stream. So the, the CUCM collects these digits sent by skinny phones using the station init message. Uh, that's all one word there, station and it. So digit anal analysis takes place in real time as well. So if I, go off on, if I go off hook on my skinny phone and I start dialing digits, those digits are sent immediately to communications manager right there, one by one. So if I want to dial from the HQ site, you know, phone one to phone two, I dial 1002. Each of those digits are sent 1002, right in a row like that. So good, uh, good thing to note there. And the digit analysis takes place in real time as well. So if you have, you know, if you have that dialed number that you sent, you have one zero zero, and the second you hit two and call manager receives two, it routes the call immediately. So it's it's basically trying to collect as much, uh, those digits 
you know, one by one, and then as soon as it gets one that matches a pattern somewhere in the system, it routes it. So it looks like a question here. So you can look at the CUCM SDI logs and just search on a station in it to find the key presses. That's exactly correct. Thank you for that, Julius. Um, so the, the logs themselves, I mean, that's an excellent troubleshooting point. I mean, if you want to see the DTMF digits actually happen, I mean, you can, you can see what happens when a phone, you know, presses digits one by one. Or, and the other scenario, too, that I was going to just talk about was the skinny phone you know, dialing the digits without going off hook, you know, and then hitting the dial key. At that point, digits are sent in block. So you can have, if you're dialing 1002, it dials 1002 right there as soon as you hit the dial key. So, and you can see all that in the, in the traces when you pull up a trace, search for the station init message, and then you can see what actually comes from the phone itself. Pretty cool. Also, uh, there's a a link I've, I've put in here, uh, and I use this tiny URL thing because the link was huge. I've, I'm, I've started doing that, or I, I started doing that about this lecture, I think, um, through the slides. So um, if you click that, it'll go through a um, couple different things with a skinny call flow. So we can click that here and check that out. All right, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So in this in this example, you have IP phone A, and you have the CUCM X they've labeled here, and IP phone B. So the first thing that happens here is that IP phone A gets the gets the phone picked up. Somebody's picked up the phone to make a call. So it sends sends the station off hook message to CUCM. CUCM then says, "Okay, I've noticed that you've gone off hook. Now I'd like to display that text to you um, to." make a call. So if you pick up the call, pick up the phone, it's going to say, you know, whatever it says, make a call. Let's, let's see here. Yeah, enter, enter number is what it says. So then it also, in addition to, to having that display text, it says station play tone. So it's going to, you want to hear dial tone, obviously. When somebody picks up a phone, they expect to hear dial tone. So CUCM, the master in this relationship, is instructing the phone to play dial tone and also set the station lamp to steady. The, the next thing that's going to happen is once that, once that feedback is generated to the user, the user knows that it's time to dial the number. So they start dialing the numbers, station digit dialed. And then now, when that first digit is dialed, CUCM instructs the phone to stop the dial tone. So if, if, you, know, if you hit that first digit, unless you're looking for outside dial tone for like a PSTN line or something, you expect that tone to stop or else you're going to be like, hey, wait a minute, why did that tone keep going? You're going to think it didn't even accept your digit. Uh, but in this case here, this, you know, this is what it's, what it's for. It's stopping the tone here for this call. And then you have another digit dialed, another digit dialed. So apparently he's, he's dialed three digits here, this person. CUCM then takes those three digits and sets up the station call information message to IP phone B. So it looks like IP phone A is calling IP phone B here sets the station lamp to blink and the ringer to on. And the point of that, obviously, is to indicate to that user that his phone's ringing. So it's time to pick it up. And the user, in this case, does pick that phone up. And, and I did miss a message here, the station call info. Um, while that phone's ringing, the CUCM is going to indicate to the original phone that called that number that the phone is, in fact, ringing. Um, and that you're going to get an alerting tone back, back for that. <clears throat> So next thing, station off hook sends that to CUCM, and then it sets the station lamp to steady, which means it stops that, that blinking, and sets the ringer to off. And the next thing, uh, stopping tone over here. And now what happens is the open receive channel message. Uh, the open receive channel message goes between those two phones, and then you have an acknowledge, open, open receive channel message acknowledge, and then you can start the media transmission and then the open receive channel ACK at the, at the other end from the original phone that dialed, and along with the conversation there. So you can see the actual messaging going back and forth is pretty logical to understand. It's, it's nothing crazy. It's just basically, you know, every single, th every single action that's necessary on a phone is described in the messaging. So you have the conversation, and then you go to the, 
the part where we, we have on hook, so that means user A hung up first. The message was sent to CUCM. CUCM instructs phone B now to close that receive channel and set the station lamp to off, stop the media transmission, and then everybody's on hook. So that's, that's an example of a simple skinny call between two endpoints. You also have you know, messages between other endpoints in the same fashion. I mean, it's going to be the same type of signaling to make that call. So uh, any questions on that? I just want to confirm with onhook SCCP dialing, digits are sent end block when call send key is hit. That's correct. Uh, when you when you don't go off hook, you just dial the digits and hit the dial key. That goes off hook and sends those digits end block all at once. The station open receive channel messages that the RTP port numbers are established. Yes, uh, so when the open receive channel message happens, that's what it's describing in that open receive channel. It says, I want you to open a receive channel to this port. And then it instructs the other side, hey, he's going to be receiving on this port. Send to that port, essentially. And so th when those messages are exchanged, then they know exactly what ports to, com to uh, communicate on for RTP. Thanks for the questions, guys. Uh, any other questions at all? Um, feel free to ask at any time. All right. So now, that, and that's just a quick overview on SCCP. MGCP, Media Gateway Control Pro Protocol, is, of course, used to control gateways. Uh, it is, it is um, a, also a master-slave protocol. And it's all text-based. So as you've guessed, probably, the master, in this case, is a call agent, or CUCM, and the slave is the actual gateway. So the gateway, in, in this case, really just takes instruction from CUCM when it's running the MGCP protocol. It can be run with a, they define them as call agents, uh, which in, in our case is going to be communications manager. So the, so the call agent is the master, gateway is a slave. It also uses the user, uh, or user, that's a typo, it uses the session description protocol, SDP, for negotiating the media streams. The SIP protocol also uses SDP to negotiate media streams as well. That's just a good little similarity between these two protocols. That's about as far as I go in terms of similarities, though. The UDP port is 2427 for control traffic, meaning the gateway is actually controlled using UDP messages on that port you know, so the communications manager is going to communicate on UDP 2427 to make that happen. And then TCP 2428 is used for backhaul. And backhaul is when you actually send the messages that are received from your ISDN trunk on Q931 directly to communi uh, the communications manager. So it exchanges keep alive packets with the gateway and the, and the call agent. So you're going to constantly know that that link is, is up, essentially, uh, because those keep alive messages are going back and forth. And so, like I mentioned, the backhaul is going to transport that signaling that's received from the gateway, from the endpoint that's connected to the ISDN network, across back to CUCM. And then CUCM can control that PRI. So it allows CUCM to recognize I ISDN status that way. And since it's a master-slave protocol, the master has all the intelligence. So all the dial plan, route patterns, digit manipulation, everything is done in CUCM. This is especially good for, for customers who don't want to have you know, multiple areas of control in their network for digit manipulation or, or, uh, or configuration. The simple way to do it is through MGCP. We all know, you know it's, not, it's on the CCI collaboration exam. It's not simple. Um, but it is, it is uh, less configuration for sure than, than maybe having the dial plan on both CUCM and through an 8323 gateway. All right, moving on to MDCP call states. Now these are, these are important to know because they define the type of messages that you're going to have with MDCP from the call agent to the gateway or from the gateway to the call agent. So the first one we're going to talk about is create connection. It's, and, and I've labeled all these in here as the where they're from and where they're going to. So that way you know what the message direction is. 
and some of them are actually bidirectional. So the first one's create connection, which is CRCX. That's the actual message that you're going to see in MGCP when you do a debug. And you say it says creates a new connection on the gateway, which is codec, bandwidth allowed, gain control, etc. So it tells the gateway to create a session with all these different settings. Um, so that message actually happens from communications manager to the gateway. The next message here is the modify connection, MDCX. And that's also from the call agent to the gateway. And what that's going to do is modify parameters with an existing connection. So if it needs to add an IP address, you know, for example, to, to the gateway in order to, to change where that stream is coming from, I mean, it'll issue the MDCX message and it'll, and it'll have the, uh, the information that needs to be changed in that message. The delete connection, DLCX, is going to be sent from either the call agent or the gateway. So as you can imagine, I mean, the, the gateway can also delete a connection because it's the thing that's actually making the physical connection with the network. So it, it has the ability to say, hey, delete connection, I've, I'm done with it. But the call agent also has the ability to do that because the user can also hang up. So that message, if you delete a connection, that's the LCX that will be coming from either direction depending on where the call was terminated. The next one is endpoint configuration, and that's from the communications manager to the gateway. And it configures the gateway with bare information. So that would be, it says here, mu law or a law, meaning G711 mu law or G711 a law, two different codecs. Uh, that you're no doubt very familiar with if you've studied uh, for the CCI voice before or, or CCNP or whatever. Um, but it will tell the gateway to configure uh, itself with that type of information to process calls. MGCP call states continued. We have now a notification request, which is the acronym is kind of backwards. We have RQNT, and that's from CUCM to the gateway. So what it does is it tells the gateway to inform the call agent when specific events occur. So you'll have like, oh, the example here is on hook, on off hook actions. So if you, if you receive a request notify from the call agent, it wants to know about specific events related to what it's telling you about. So if, if it does send you know, if it wants an on-off hook action or status, you know, it wants notification on that. It wants to it requests notification from the gateway on that. So that's a good way to remember that too. If a request notify requests to be notified <laughs> from the gateway. So that's how I always remembered it. Um, oh, got a question here. Station, oh, oh, let's see. Is that mixing RQNT and, and notify? Ooh, it may, actually. No. No, it's, it's not actually, Lou. Thanks for pointing that out, though. You made me think about it. Um, it still is, is notifi notification request. It still has the, uh, the acronym is correct there. Um, good, good catch, though, because you know, never know. These are beta, as you say. So, <laughs> um, The next one here is uh, audit endpoint, which is AUEP. And that's again, it, as you can see, there's a recurring theme here happening where we have a lot of messages from the call agent to the gateway. So what this is going to do is try to audit port status, which is going to be bare info, signal status, event status. And port status, I mean, you can see the difference here between audit endpoint and audit connection. One is going to, they're both going to audit, obviously. They, they both want information from the gateway. But one's going to be used to discover, to discover the status of a particular connection and one's going to be used to discover the status of a port, meaning many different connections. Um, so the, the audit endpoint is going to come back with a lot of different statuses on the different channels that are available on, on the gateway. And then the audit connection will come back with one specific, um, one specific in piece of information on a connection on the gateway. Next one here is notify, and that one is from the gateway to call agent. And now, so that, that's like the kind of uh, the response to the request notify. So it's going to notify then back to the call agent the information that it wants to know. So in this case, I, I had an example of on-off hook actions like we had in the previous page there. 
it would inform the call agent when specific events occur because the call agent requested that that be notified to them. The next thing here is restart in progress, which is RSIP. That is from the gateway to the call agent and informs the call agent that the gateway is taking ports out of service and bringing them back in service. So you'll have, so there's three types here that, that I've highlighted. You have restart, graceful, and forced. Restart is, endpoint is completely in service, and, and that, that's the, the type that's going to be forced when the endpoint is in service. The graceful is going to wait till the call is actually cleared before it does anything, um, before the reset in progress actually happens, and then forced actually takes the endpoint out of service. So the restart, once again, has the endpoint in service, keeps the endpoint in service, graceful, wait until the call clearing, and then forced endpoint is out of service. So another link here on different call states in, in MGCP, which I definitely recommend that you check out. Uh, we'll go here and look at a little bit of it right now. This is basically a great example of what some of these messages look like. So you can, you can say, this one says, debug sequence for when a handset goes off hook and a user dials digits. So you can see these notify messages are happening here uh, to a particular endpoint, you know, and then each of these are going to tell you what exactly is going on. So I think this is a great link you know, to actually learn what these messages actually do. Um, so we can go and look at some of these here and let's take an example. on that voice call that, it, that shows originating and terminating sides. I won't go through the whole thing, but just to give you an idea of what kind of messages it received. So you have this notify event. Remember, which, which side does notify come from? Or the NT, N, NTFY, where does that come from? Julius has got it right. Comes from the gateway. Dan's got it right too. Uh, so that this message then is coming from the gateway at this endpoint. Didn't really talk about endpoints too much, but let me, it's pretty small too. Let me see if I can enlarge that a little bit. The endpoint is going to specify the actual port where this is coming from. This happens to be an analog port. See this analog line basically. And then this is port 101. So that's just how it's identified in MGCP. And then this is the, the router name and then the domain name at the end of it. So, and the, the whole thing together in MGCP is called the domain name. So this is the endpoint at domain. It's a good, good thing to know as well. So you see the notify message coming in here. It's just sent to the call agent to report the observed event. Notify sequence number is 166. So we've, we've uh, got this in, in the middle of a message basically. So you, originally you got a request notify from the call agent for this and then notify sent that message from the gateway back to the call agent. So let's kind of scroll through here and see if we can get any other good ones. Okay, so this one here is a create connection, CRCX. Now which endpoint is going to issue the CRCX. Correct. Call agent or CUCM. So this we know now just by seeing the CRCX that this is coming from the call agent. So we have this uh, create connection message received from the call agent and a sequence number of 2879. So we know what this 2879 means now. It's just a random number sitting out there. Um, and then you can kind of go through and see what the endpoint ID is, the version, MGCP 0.1, the notified entity ID with the destination port number. So everything is, is basically outlined here. And I won't go through all of them just in the interest of time, but definitely have a look at this. It's a very, very good link for uh, studying for the CCI voice or CCI collaboration written. <laughs> All right, and here's an example that I popped in the slides, the delete connection. You can see MGCP packet received, DLCX, 
with what is this, a sequence number? That's what we said. And then this is the analog port 101. And then the router name dot domain name. So the whole thing collectively known as the domain name. So that's what a delete connection looks like from the MGCP side. And then now you have, here's a modify connection which will actually go through and you know you can see that it's received. Where's, where's the modify connection come from again? Gotta throw these quizzers in there. Keep you guys on your toes. Good deal, from CA. And also, when in doubt, just say it's from the call agent because there's like, you know, 28 of them that come from the call agent and like three from the gateway, so. <laughs> um, but you can see, you know, in this message, it's actually modifying uh, some connection parameters here. You have the connection ID, which is, you know, IPv4 13202.6. It's modifying that IP address. And this is the, you know, the port number of the RTP audio stream. Notice it's an even port number. It's, and the M, M, M in this case signifies media. You also notice that if you looked at de SIP debugs, this looks very similar to how a session description protocol would look in SIP because, in fact, it is the same thing. SDP is both in MDCP and SIP. All right, MDCP return codes. This is also similar to SIP, um, not exactly the same thing, but very similar. The response acknowledgement message. So you're saying, I got that, I got that message from you. I'm acknowledging that. That's just a straight up zeros, three zeros. The rest of them are are basically you know variations of of each of the subset of numbers, one, two, four, five. And the one set is a transa uh, transaction executed relation message or related messages. Uh, two is gonna be transaction successful, like 200 okay that you might see in SIP. You'll get just a 200 in MGCP. Four XX is transient error messages, like a 404. Permanent error message, you might see like a 501. Um, so, those are the different types of return codes in SIP or in, in MGCP, and also you'll see in SIP as well, they're very similar. All right, MGCP commands. And we can get into actual uh, gateway configuration. We can actually look at the gateway and check these out too. But I wanted to point out a few of these commands before we did that. The CCM manager fallback dash MGCP command enables the PRI to have somewhere to fall back to if, if it loses connection to the call engine. So this is perfectly useful in an SRST scenario where a survival, survivable remote site telephony scenario where you lose your WAN link connection and you have to recover somehow. So if you lose your WAN link and you're using an MGCP gateway, your call control is gone at that point because you, you know, remember the gateway is just a, a slave to the master, you know, call manager. So if call manager is controlling the gateway and you lose your WAN link, then you're not able to control your gateway anymore unless you're somehow able to fall back to local control of that PRI. You know, in this case, with fallback MGCP, it's going to fall back to H323, which would be the service alternate default command. Um, so the, the next one here, uh, CCM manager switchback graceful, enables the graceful switchback from one CUCM server to another during a CUCM failure. So let's say, for example, that you have an MGCP gateway connected to two different call manager servers in the same cluster, obviously in the same cluster, but you have two subscribers, let's say, and one is your primary call agent, and that primary call agent goes down. So you're on the backup call agent now. Everything's working just fine. You're making calls. The gateway's working fine. But now that primary call agent comes up. Well, if this graceful command is configured for this CCM manager switchback graceful, it's going to, to basically allow any calls to complete, the, basically, basically that PRI to be quiet before it does anything to disrupt any connections. So it's gonna, it's gonna just take its time getting back, essentially. You also have the option of immediate, which obviously a call's, a call's gonna stay up. I mean, it's, it's RTP between endpoints at that point. Um, but you have immediate switchback, never switchback, I mean, you, you basically manually do that by shutting down the MGCP process and bringing it back up. Uh, schedule time, meaning that maybe you schedule it during off hours if it's switched. And then uptime delay. So based on 
a certain amount of uptime, it allows a call agent then to switch over. Next command here to pay attention to is the uh, CCM Manager Redundant Host. And that defines, let me just move out of the way a little bit, <laughs> defines the other CUCM servers to which the gateway can connect. So that means that if you do have that call agent that is your, your standby call agent, this CCM Manager Redundant Host command is going to specify that server that you're going to connect to as a backup. So the, the primary command is just going to be MGCP call agent, but then if you have the CCM manager redundant host command, then that's going to say, all right, my backup for this call agent is going to be this server. Uh, the next one, CCM manager music on hold is going to enable music on hold, <laughs> oddly enough. Um, so that command is actually, it is necessary to, to enable the streaming of music on hold in MGCP, though. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, next set of commands here, MGCP call agent, which I just talked about, defines the primary call agent that the gateway is going to use to to have its master relationship with. It's going to be controlling that gateway, gateway. The MGCP bind command. This is a very fun command that uh, generally can cause some problems in configurations because when you're when you're first bringing up a, a gateway and you use the bind command, a lot of the times what's going to happen is that bind command is going to prevent you from, from getting a multiple frame established status on your ISDN connection. And what needs to happen in that case is you just remove the command and re-add the command. And that's been a source of frustration for a lot of different people. I know I was one of those people when I first found that out. It kind of blew my mind like, all right, so I delete the command and re-add the command and then it works? Okay, so, but the point of the bind command is to tell the MGCP process to use a specific interface for its communication. So if I want to use my loopback interface, which is probably desirable because that's always going to be up, I use that as my source interface and then that communicates with the call agent or call manager using that loopback address. That's all that really amounts to. And you can do that for both media and control. Yeah, the, the Alan, the bind command was the one I was talking about that gave me fits. Um, and that was because it, it hung up the status on the ISDN circuit. So, and, and the way to fix that was just to delete the command and re-add it and multiple frame established right after that. <clears throat> okay, next thing. MGCP DTMF relay codec defines DTMF re related parameters essentially and allows you to change the way that DTMF is processed on the MGCP gateway, whether that's in band or out of band. Um, you know, RFC 2833, it allows you to specify the specific type of DTMF you want to use in MGCP. And lastly, the MGCP app command associates a dial peer with an MGCP connection. So if you want to control an analog port, you know, you'll or or a dial peer or whatever, you put that MGCP app under the dial peer in order to control that on the call manager side. And also uh, no, another great link on MGCP, nice little summary here. We'll click on that. Understanding MGCP interactions with call manager, so. Here, well, here's a good little breakdown of the analog, you know, or the endpoint type and what that all means. So this is a great link to go through as well. I mean, it explains kind of everything I've, I've gone through. Um, but it's, it's definitely a good thing to keep in your back pocket. Go check it out uh, when you're going back through the slides later. Um, something that Julius just brought up here that he said, no MGCP, MG, MGCP will work. Um, I got to disagree with you there on that one, um, and the only reason why is because I, I know from experience it's very painful um, to have to troubleshoot this over and over again. So I, it in some cases it may work. I'm not ruling it out, but I know for sure 100% of the time if you remove that bind command and re-add it, it's worked for me. If I have that that TEI assigned, the dreaded TEI assigned status <laughs> in the ISDN, 
Um, and and Julius, that's that's awesome. He's so Julius has had some success with just shutting off MGCP and turning it back on, which is great. Hey, whatever works, man. I'm with you. Um, but definitely, uh, you know, if you run into that, think about shutting down MGCP, bringing it back up, and also think about that bind command. All right. So moving on to MGCP registration. How does the gateway actually talk to communications manager to register with it? Of course, we talked about this backhaul link, which is using TCP. So it's got to open a TCP socket with, with the, uh, the gateway. And then from there, this is, this is the reset and progress command from the gateway to communications manager to inform that the gateway is being brought into service. So that's the gateway when it, when it registers and brings itself up, it's gonna send that RSIP message saying, hey, I'm, I'm resetting everything based on what you just told me. <laughs> um, and then call manager acknowledges that. And then after that's done, it sends an audit endpoint request, which remember what the audit endpoint request does? Does it do a connection or does it do a port? Okay, excellent. And good way to remember that too is obviously audit endpoint ends in a P for port and audit connection, you're just looking at one specific connection. So a good way to keep that in your mind. Uh, the gateway is then going to acknowledge that message from the call manager and then call manager will send a request notify and then get an acknowledge back. So it asks the gateway to confer, inform CCM of any changes one per endpoint. So that's uh, the standard request. So that's how the MGCP gateway registers. Very quick registration process. So here's an example FXS call and we haven't gotten into the analog signaling yet but FXS means um, foreign exchange station and that's a port that is connected to a phone. So that means a phone is making a call through an MGCP gateway. And remember MGCP can control FXS ports as well. So Notify here um, that the line has been taken off hook, and then you get a dial tone back. So very similar to how Skinny would do that. You would, phone goes off hook, and Skinny says, "Well, I got to provide dial tone, or I got to tell it to provide dial tone." So it does the same thing there. And then you see notify four is pressed, and then it turns off dial tone just like Skinny would. And then digit five is pressed, and then it creates a connection because apparently four and five is all that needed to dial. Uh, that, that was a valid dial string. And so it creates a connection and turns on ringtone. And then it gets axed and, you know, determines the RTP ports and everything it needs to communicate on after that. So before I go into SIP, um, are, do you guys want to see uh, some sample configuration in the actual gateway itself? Or do you want to skip that part? Okay, cool. Looks like a, a bunch of skips. If you guys, if there's somebody that did want to see it, um, just ping me after class or whatever, we can go through it. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to SIP, which is Session Initiation Protocol. And SIP is all over this exam, uh, both the written exam and the lab exam. So this is a huge, huge thing to understand. Um, SIP is, is a pretty easy protocol to look at in a debug. Um, it's mostly logical, I would say, you know, looking at the debug itself and, and trying to pick out what parts are what. I think it's relatively easy to understand. It doesn't mean it's the easiest thing in the world. I mean, it's still looking at a debug. So, But it is an IETF standards protocol, and it's obviously been evolved many different times. There's been many amendments to the original RFC for SIP. So there's been a lot of different things added to the protocol to refine it and make it better. It's an application layer protocol that uses either TCP or UDP for transmission. So it has the ability to use both protocols to transmit data. It's a text-based protocol similar to HTTP. So for those of you who have, you know, programmed websites before in HTTP, this is your lucky day because SIP is very similar in how those messages go back and forth. 
Uh, SIP uses TCP and UDP port 5060. And that's just the standard port. It can also use a bunch of different ports just like anything else can, but the standard port is 5060. All right. SDP, like I mentioned before, session description protocol is used just like it's used in MGCP for negotiating the media type and format. So when you have an SDP passing from one SIP endpoint to another SIP endpoint, that means it's trying to negotiate media between those two endpoints. And it, it, it operates in an offer answer approach. So that means that if I'm sending an initial SDP or initial invite or whatever and it has an SDP in that initial invite, I'm offering the codecs that I have for that specific call. So if, if I'm offering, you know, G711, G, G729, ILBC, or whatever, and the other endpoint only has G729, well, it's, that's what the call will be because you have an offer and then you have an answer. The, the other side can answer back, all right, let's just use G729 because that's, that's all I can support. And so it's pretty easy to see that in the debug going back and forth. The, uh, and the, the next thing here, resources are identified by SIP URI which is different from the directory URI, if you caught my V lectures in the last couple weeks on directory URIs. Um, the SIP name, is it, it's, it starts out with SIP colon username and password po possibly if that's required in the string at host colon port. So the port would be 5060 most of the time. The host is going to be maybe an IP address, maybe a domain name depending if you have DNS in your network. And then the username is going to be, you know, a phone number in a lot of cases it'll be like uh, let's say for example if I'm making a call from HQ phone 1 it'll be 1001 so 1001 at 10.10.13.11 colon 5060 would be that URI that's that's passed when I'm actually sending a call somewhere make sense everybody cool with that all right a distinction between skinny and SIP for how DTMF digits are sent. Remember DTMF, dual tone multi-frequency, multi happens when you press a key. SIP sends those digits in band by default, but it also can use the, the out-of-band DTMF if necessary. So there's a few DTMF methods that are important to know for this, this written exam and also for the lab exam. You have keypad markup language, which is KPML, and that's an out-of-band method. So that means it's sent over a control channel that's not the same as the audio channel. This is similar to Skinny because Skinny uses those, those messages that come out of band that are in the station and NIP message. Um, so, so it's similar to Skinny where analysis occurs in real time as well, and it uses these SIP notify messages. So instead of the station init, you're going to get a SIP notify when you're using KPML. So it sends digit by digit analysis. And one thing too I want to mention about the DTMF methods that I don't think I mentioned before is the difference between in-band and out-of-band. Of course, out-of-band uses that control channel. In-band uses the actual audio stream itself. But when you do that, you need to make sure that the, if you're using in-band for DTMF, you need to make sure that that audio stream can actually send those frequencies. Remember, these codecs now are advanced and they're designed specifically for speech and not for tones that go across the network. So if you, you know, hit the number two key, you know, it may not interpret that correctly because it's expecting a voice to come through uh, and, and synthesize that voice and not synthesize the, the key press. So if you're running G729 and you're running DTMF in band, you might have some problems because G729 is an adaptive linear predictive codec and it's going to try to synthesize that speech according to how you're inputting that, that speech and, and not frequency. And you're, you're not going to talk like a phone would with a DTMF key press. So you have to ensure that you use some type of codec that can pass those uh, DTMF digits un, unmodified at all. So I, I wasn't sure if I mentioned that earlier. I wanted to make sure that you understood that though. Uh, the next method here is unsolicited notify, which is an out-of-band method as well, but it's non-standards based. Still possible to use the unsolicited notify message. Uh, the, the next one is pretty common uh, message to use, it's, or message, it's pretty common DTMF method to use, uh, which is NTE, Network Termination Equipment, or more commonly known as RFC 2833. 
And this is an in-band method that sends everything within, within the audio stream itself. That's known as RFC 2833. What is the default for SIP on UCM RFC 23? Actually, um, it can the, the default on UCM is KPML for SIP, so key, pre, key press markup language. So everything's sent um, out of band um, on, on uh, CUCM. But you can configure your, your SIP trunk you know, to use RFC 2833 or adapt to whatever the other system is using, that type of thing. So... Uh, yeah, hope that answered your question there, Julius. Uh, SIP dial rules is the next thing I want to talk about here. SIP dial rules on a CUCM are configured to allow SIP phone to download a dial plan file, which is dial plan XML, from the CUCM TFC, TFTP server on boot. So the dial plan.xml file is going to be stored locally on that phone, and then the phone can access the file essentially for all the dial plan information. So if you have, you know, digits that you want processed within that dial plan locally on the phone, you can do that and then send them to communications manager. So when dialing, those digits are analyzed first against that locally stored file. And then when a number is matched in the file and the timeout is zero, meaning there's no wait time allowed, the SIP invites message is sent immediately to CUCM. The SIP invite message is the way that the call, that a SIP, call starts. It's going to send an invite to the other end and say, I'm inviting you to this call. That's the logic behind that. So if there's not a match, though, in that dial plan, that XML file, the digits are sent to CUCM when the interdigit timeout expires, which by default is 15 seconds. So that the interdigit uh, timeout or the interdigit inter timer is also called what? Does anybody know the top of their head for bonus points? Yes, you guys all get bonuses. T.302, excellent. So, good deal. All right, so moving on, uh, KPML phones can use the dial plan.xml file, but it disables KPML because it has to go through this dial plan XML file. KPML is going to just send it digit by digit to communications manager, so it, so it gets interpreted that way. So then, with that in mind, SIP dial rules always take priority over KPML because it disables it when it uses it. So here is a nice little link on SIP dial rules themselves. This is another one, another important one to pay attention to. Let's see if I can make that centered. If I go through and, and look at some of these things, I mean, it tells you how to configure the SIP dial rules, tells you how to go through communications manager and do that. Um, there are a couple different things that I wanted to point out here. Because you're going to see basically in SIP dollar rules that the characters are a lot different than normal route patterns that you would see. It's not like, uh, you know, just an XXX to say 0 through 9. You know, they're, they're different, uh, different values. Actually right here I think is what I wanted to show you. So like a period will match any, di any digit, just like an iOS. A hyphen means more digits can be entered. So there, there are some different rules that you want to get familiar with to how you would you would make a SIP dial rule um, to to download to your file. So definitely good stuff to know in there. Have a look at that link and make sure you're familiar with it. So Eric's pointed out that the T three hundred two by default is ten seconds in iOS. I think you're right on that. And, and in call manager is fifteen seconds. Um, we can check that out, though. Let me write that down. Okay. Move on to uh, SIP network elements. <clears throat> so these are the the different roles that a SIP SIP clients and devices can play in the network. You have SIP user agent, first of all, which is kind of a general term. You can have a user agent client, user agent server, but it manages, manages a SIP session. 
Endpoints can act as both a user agent client and a user agent server. So a user agent client would be one that actually is sending a request out to, to have a conversation. User agent server can, can act as, as a device that forwards the request on to another, uh, another user agent client. So actually it says it right here. Initiates requests and receives responses from user agent server or SIP proxy server. That's a user agent client. It's a temporary role though because it only lasts for the duration of the session. So you could change roles based on session and that's, and that's why you know, these roles in the network can change significantly. A user agent server just responds to SIP requests by accepting, rejecting, or redirecting the request. And also as a temporary role that lasts the duration of the session. So anybody can really be a user agent server as long as it can respond to SIP requests by accepting, rejecting, or redirecting the request. A SIP proxy server is going to provide routing, policy enforcement, features, authentication, and authorization. CUCM is an example of a SIP proxy server because it does all of those different things. Any questions so far? And this water bottle didn't stand a chance. Talking this much really <laughs> dries you out. All right, uh, moving on here uh, to SIP network elements, uh, the, the continuation of that. A SIP redirect server is a user agent server that provides address translation. So if you get, well, the, it generates this 3xx redirection response to requests. And so it allows the SIP proxy server, which could actually be the same device, a SIP redirect server and a SIP proxy server, to redirect invites to external domains. So what that means is, you might see a redirect message saying, this extension has moved, you know, this extension is now here. Redirect over to that extension. And so it would send a 3xx message to respond to that. And that's a perfectly legal response according to the RFC. And Dan, you point out uh, that back-to-back -back user agent usually, meaning call manager is a back-to-back -back user agent. Um, and so, Technically, yes, it, it is, and it could be all, all these other roles as well. Um, and you stole one of my questions at the end, so. <laughs> ah, okay. What role does Cube usually play was the question that he was answering there. And Cube would be playing a back-to-back -back user agent because Cube is in the center of this communication that you have communications manager going to Cube and then Cube going to another device somewhere. And so now it's going to take a request from this side and send it out, send out the request on this side. So it's performing a back-to-back -back function. The uh, SIP registrar server is the next one I want to talk about. Uh, it's the endpoint that accepts register messages from UAs, user, user agents. So what is that an example of, a registrar server? Where might that exist? Well, a registrar, a registrar server is going to exist in Communications Manager, Communications Manager Express. It's basically the way that that phone is going to register with the server. And, and it, it tells the server about its location, meaning its IP address. So it's, it's also acting as a location server at that point. So CUCM performs a lot of different functions that are defined separately in SIP. I mean, you can have all these different SIP functions can be different at different devices in some fashion. A lot of the SIP call processing, call processing agents that you're going to see have them all in one though. So users can register their current location with the registrar server of course, meaning that that IP address is in the server's configuration now. All right, now you have the SIP request methods. Talked about invite a little bit. Invite is when a user agent client is actually going to send out a request to another endpoint inviting them to a session. So that invite request, if you're, a, if you're a 9971 phone, SIP phone on Communications Manager, you're going to send that invite to Communications Manager to, to kind of interpret, you know, where to, where to go with that. I mean, you're going to, you, you only have the call agent to, communi uh, to communicate with, and that call agent is going to tell you where to go from there. So you send that request to, to Communications Manager, and the Communications Manager takes care of the rest, essentially. So... Uh, user agent server receives the invite, invite and responds to that. So a 
communications manager would be an example of a user agent server in that scenario. So Eric points out, iOS Gateway could be a SIP registrar server when running SIP SRST. That's absolutely correct because in, in, the, in the same fashion, I mean, you'll have C, CUCME running that, that uh, CUCME SIP configuration under, under voice register global. And then you have, in the SRST scenario, it's basically using the same underlying processes to run that. You can do the same thing with that. So good point there, Eric. All right. Next message here was register, which is used by the user agent to indicate its current IP address and or location. And that's going to be sent to the call agent. So Cisco SIP phones send the MAC and register lines with CCM using this method. So that's in order to behave more like skinny phones that was done so the queue can send the MAC address as well you know, to register with the server. And then of course ACK, that's the easiest one you're going to learn all day. ACK is just acknowledge and of course that's logical because you already know that, most, most of you. Uh, it confirms that the message was received and is sent in reply to the final response from the user agent server. Sent in reply to the final response. So an ACK is only sent in that scenario. And lastly, buy is going to terminate that session between user agent clients. So that's to actually signify the end of the session. Cancel is where one of the sides sends, a, well actually it would be the calling side that sends this because you're going to initiate an invite and then maybe hang up the call because you dialed the wrong number or you didn't want to talk to that person or whatever. So it would, SIP would then send a cancel message to the server and you can only really send a cancel when that final response has not been received. So that means when a call is up, you can't send a cancel to, to the other end because it's not going to do anything. You can send a buy to the other end and it will hang up the call, but you can't send a cancel. Options is used to request information about the capabilities of a caller. So it, it, it's going to define, you know, obviously the different capabilities you can get from each SIP endpoint. The provisional response acknowledgement adds the acknowledgement system to the provisional responses. So it's it's basically allow you know a form of acknowledgement for these different messages that you're going to have going across the SIP network to make sure that they're received. So it's a good good way to, to verify that that communication is actually happening. You know, so the server can rest easy <laughs> that the communication has happened. So all right. So now onto the SIP responses. Any questions so far? Actually, I've got one just come up. With SIP phones and UCM, where do you identify what DTMF is to be used? So let's look at that real quick, actually. <clears throat> let's pull that up. I got a million windows open now. Play the waiting game for the login here. <laughs> Julius, I need to send you the, the, the laughing face on that one. I like that. <laughs> All right. So if I pull up this 9971 phone that I have registered here, the question was, where do you identify uh, the DTMF that's going to be used? Well, I don't think it's in the phone page, but required DTMF reception. I believe that the DTMF is going to be in this SIP profile section here. Um, but let's have a look and verify that. Here's DTMF DB level, nominal. <laughs> well, I guess it's not in there. Maybe uh, security profile. Well, that would be sick. SIP trunk security profile. 
Actually, I'm not sure on that, to be honest with you. I thought it was it directly in the, uh, the SIP profile there. Turns out I was wrong, which is allowed. You can never know everything, right? Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and look that one up uh, after class. I'll get back to you guys on that one. It's a good question. Yeah, definitely, um, definitely there are a lot of DTMF-related issues when it comes to, you know, connecting to third-party systems and different providers and things like that. So good, uh, good thing to know. So on a SIP trunk using RFC 2833 and G729, is an MTP required? Um, well, let's see. So RFC 2833 is an in-band DTMF method, and you're using G729. So I would think yes, probably, because there's, there's no way that you can send in-band across G729 there. Um, so I, I would say yes on that. John, thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, back to these res uh, SIP responses here. Uh, provisional is 1XX. Just Now, this is similar to MGCP, like I said, but it's not the exact same. Provisional is when the request has been received and is being processed, and it's informational only. It doesn't have any bearing on the session. You can have, you know, 1,000, you know, 1XX messages come through, and it doesn't have any bearing on what happens in the session, whether the call gets disconnected. It's just informational. Success is obviously what you want to see, and that is the 200 OK message that'll that'll pop through. Uh, there's obviously there's other messages in that as well. Indicates that the previous action was successful. So whenever you get a 200 OK, whatever happened before that was successful. The redirection we already talked about a little bit, which is the 3XX. That means that further action should be taken by the sender, and that sender should be redirecting to another user agent client. So the user agent server has said hey, this number is moved or whatever, uh, you need to redirect to this other number. And so the, the user agent client does that. The, oh, here we got a question here. Explain your answer to John's question. G729 won't allow in-band DTMF. Now, um, to explain that, I, I, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, but when you have in-band DTMF going across a, a low bandwidth codec like that. So what happens is you have, how can I explain this a little bit differently? You have G729, which is adaptive linear predictive codec, which means that it, it's designed to actually take your voice in and then synthesize that into digital packets. So it, it predicts the type of waveform that's coming next based on the previous one. So that's why it's able to, to cut down that bandwidth so much. And so if it's not a voice stream that's coming through, it can't properly analyze that frequency. So if you press DTMF key or you know, whatever key on the phone that generates a DTMF digit, going through that G729 codec, it's not going to be able to pass that information through the codec because the codec is, is, is expecting the voice to come through it. So if it can't analyze that, then that means DTMF won't be passed properly. So you need to have some type of, of out-of-band method or maybe an MTP to uh, accommodate that scenario uh, because if, if you're going to be doing that, then it's just not able to pass that information. I hope that clears that up. Okay, cool. All right, uh, moving on here to the, the next one here, server error 5XX. So just like HTTP, if you have a server error, you'll see like a 501 unauthorized or something like that. Um, that's just like what you'll see in SIP. So 5XX, failure to execute the request from the user agent client. And another thing too, like you see these codes that come through like 501 unauthorized. The unauthorized part of that code is not or the, the string part of that code that says unauthorized is not necessary. It's, it's just a descriptive term that's put in there by whoever wrote the protocol on that specific device. That could say anything according to whatever the developer wanted to say. But the 501 is the important part that's interpreted by the SIP protocol. Just wanted to point that out. The uh, global failure 
option here is 6xx. That means that requests cannot be filled at any server. So any server in the enterprise, um, I don't know that I've seen a 6xx come across my desk, <laughs> but uh, it's good to know for the written exam there. Okay, sample SIP call flow. This is what you've all been waiting for, I know. Uh, and th obviously this, this link too is pretty important. I made it another tiny URL because it was a huge link, but a good link on call flows itself. So you have a call flow between SIP phone A and SIP phone B. So you send an invite out to SIP phone B from SIP phone A, and then you have this 180 ringing message com coming back. And 180 is in the, which category of responses is 180? Right, informational is the, the type of response that 180 will be. And I, Scott, I just I saw your question there. What happened to the four XX response codes? Uh, that would be a omission by myself. So apologize about that. Four XX is like a not found message, or, or you might you might see a four XX message when it's not able to resolve some type of directory number. Um, sorry about that. I forgot to include that in there. Let me, I'll add that to the slides, of course, before you guys get them. So what, what do we say about informational messages? Basically, they have, they have no bearing on the session. It's just a nice thing to know. It's a nice thing to know from the other side that, all right, the device is ringing. It's, it's good. We've you know, got session progress and so forth. The, the real, where the rubber meets the road, the real message that, that's really good here is the 200 OK. That's what we're looking for. So we got a 200 OK, and then we send an ACK because that's the final response to that message. So. That now that uh, that basically SIP dialogue, or or that SIP transaction or whatever is is complete based on that. So you have the invite ringing came back, 200 OK came back, and now we send an ACK back. And now after that ACK happens, we have our two-way RTP channel, and we have um, we have another invite coming here for send only, and a 200 OK and an ACK meaning that A is on hold. So what happens here, what happened here is that B actually put A on hold and you can see invite A equals send only. A is, is audio, meaning it's, it's only sending audio, it's not receiving any. So A is, A is gonna be on hold there. And 200 OK came back and then an ACK from phone B in response to that 200 OK. You always need to have an ACK in response to a 200 OK message. So then when it takes the user off hold, it has to send a send receive now. So it's going to be both sending and receiving on that audio stream. And then of course, A sends a 200 OK, B sends an ACK, all is right with the world. And they, they have uh, RTP between these two devices again. That's just a very simple, basic call flow. And real quick, just to show you what this link has. has some good information about actual SIP call flows in here, the different responses, and you can see SIP 4XX is client failure responses, which I, I failed to put in the PowerPoint presentation. So you can kind of go through and see, you know, the different call setups that you might, you might have. You know, PBX, Gateway, SIP user phone, you know, how these calls actually work. The same way, basically. I mean, you got, you got setup coming from the PBX, in this case, and now you're you're having your gateway terminate the configuration from the PBX. Gateway is running SIP, so it sends an invite to this user B phone, and then you have a call proceeding coming back from the gateway saying, "All right, I've I've taken care of it. I've sent the call out. It's proceeding." And then, meanwhile, the SIP user B phone is saying, "I'm tr I'm trying that extension," or you know that that server might come back and saying, "I'm trying the extension." And then now it's saying, saying ringing. Of course, you notice that there are two informational messages coming back from that specific device. So obviously you can have as many of those messages as you want. They're just good, good information to know. And then so now we have the alerting tone sent back to the original phone that called from the PBX. And then a 200 OK comes back, which translates into a connect message on this, uh, on this side here on the PBX. And of course you have the act come back from the gateway and now RTP is established on this link here between 
the you know the gateway and the site B user phone, and then the two-way voice path is exchanged between the gateway and the PBX. So that might be you know a, a tie line or something that's a, you know a digital link that's connected between those two systems. So a lot of different call flows like that and explanations for each of those call flows. Very cool link right here. Um, good, uh, good bedtime reading probably. <laughs> All right. So, but definitely good to know for the for the written exam and the lab exam. Good prep. Are provisional and informational interchangeable terms for one XX responses, or is there, or is there more to or is there two more? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Or is there more to the different terms? More to the different terms? I think um, <laughs> I think they're interchangeable, honestly. We'll have to verify that. I mean, I, I think I've heard provisional and informational used in the same way. Um, but we'll have to look that up and, and verify that. Go ahead and write that down in my to-do list. You're welcome, Scott. <laughs> Not a problem, buddy. All right. Now, a uh, cool little thing here. Let me see if I can. OK. SIP early offer and SIP delayed offer. I'll, actually, um, how are you guys doing? You guys need a break? You guys heard enough of me for a little while? Coffee, please. <laughs> yeah, get some caffeine in your systems. Uh, all right, let's do uh, let's do five minutes. Come back at three o two. Ready, go. <laughs> all right, see you soon. <laughs>